So, welcome back, Ivan, to the second session in our yeah. journey through the realms of DDD. Uh, yeah. We're really happy to see you here once again. And uh, everyone is here, so just uh, yeah, you can take it away. Thank you, Mans. Uh, it's always a pleasure to share some uh, tech stuff. And, and this and today will be something that I enjoy a lot, which is DDD. And and I I prepared some some slides to introduce the the concept. Uh, let me see. Yes, so uh, if you don't know me yet, uh, I am more well known on the GitHub. Uh, I support many open source projects uh, on clean architecture, domain driven design and test driven development. So most of the things I'm gonna introduce today are techniques that I'm applying on my open source projects and studying it and trying out uh, different uh, ways of implementation. And but today, uh, as an introduction to domain driven design, uh, there are two main pillars of domain driven design. One is the strategic design and the other the tactical design. The strategic design is in a high level. It embraces people's and interactions. Um, the, the business, uh, domain experts, and the development uh, collaboration. So the strategic design is about interactions between people, development, uh, and how you map uh, this into code. And the tactical design is a more lower level way of designing and building a language uh, that reflects the domain into code. Uh, on the strategic design, you have tools. Uh, one of them is context mapping, uh, which is uh, a practice that you uh, that you execute to, to design your project. And on the tactical design, you have building blocks, kind of patterns that you can use to better implement your code. But let's say uh, on a strategic design, uh, the three major concepts are bounded context, which is a conceptual boundary, uh, which the terms should be unambiguous. And this language inside of this bounded context should be clear for the domain experts, which are people that have more knowledge of the domain and business, and the development team that knows the implementation details, but the same uh, vocabulary is reflected in code. The context maps, uh, the relationship between bounded contexts, and the ubiquitous language is the language that is built between these people and is reflected in the source code. Um, as an example of uh, bounded context, we, we could say that uh, here we have sales bounded context and support bounded context. On, on sales, um, we usually have a customer, a product, and someone that made that sales, uh, which is a, which is a person. But when we are talking about uh, the support, like receiving a ticket, we also have product, have a defect, we know the customer. Uh, but we can say that there is no single customer or no single product that could uh, uh, see, uh, be multi-purpose 
for the sales bounded context and to the support bounded context. So inside of these bounded contexts, they have its own uh, uh, vocabulary and the vocabulary uh, fills the purpose of this bounded context. Uh, one, uh, another, in addition of bounded context, we, we usually, we can categorize that we have core bounded contexts where it's where your business is like in a is on a step ahead and you have this support bounded context even like uh, a bounded context that you don't need to put much much effort on it because you can use a existing solution or something from the market so we have these differences and when you are designing uh, on the domain driven design the, the strategic design uh, has the context mapping which you can create a relationship between bounded context because it is it's important to know uh, what kind of collaboration exists between the bounded contexts uh, for instance, we have here sales bounded context and customer bounded context. Um, the context map will say like could be a shared kernel partner anti-corruption layer. And this, uh, this list represents the kind of relationship between these bounded contexts. For instance, if I say that sales bounded context and customer bounded context have a shared kernel, means that they, they are sharing some, some library, the, the boundary between uh, sales and customer is very, uh, is very thin and shared kernel requires a strong collaboration when you're designing the sales and the customer. Uh, in, in the other hand, if you say that the sales uh, has a conformist relationship with the customer bounded context, we are saying that um, you don't have much of collaboration between those two bounded contexts. You just accept uh, what uh, one bounded context offers to you. So uh, that is the, that's the challenge uh, of the context mapping. When you are designing the software, you are going to create boundaries. And these boundaries are the bounded context. But then when you create this, you need to know what kind of collaboration these bounded contexts have with its uh, with each other and we we can't simply say that uh, we are going to be partner with all bounded contexts we have because if you if you're saying that you're a partner you are developing the bounded context together and every uh, everyone has a say on all bounded contexts, but in reality, this is not what happened. So, uh, for instance, the shared kernel requires a strong collaboration between the peers. And another technique to apply is using the anti-corruption layer, where you simply build a fence between two bounded contexts. But you can't go one all in on shared kernel, or you can't simply go all in on anti-corruption layer because one solution for everything, uh, you are going to pay the cost of uh, both both sides. So there is no single solution for everything. Um, uh, and there is a, a different cost implementing these separations. For instance, if you say that the bounded contexts have a shared kernel mapping between them, it's kind of a, a low cost 
to move objects from one boundary to the other when you are learning about that domain. But if we start and creating very strong uh, walls between the bounded contexts and, and say that uh, there is an anti-corruption layer between every one of those bounded contexts, then you, uh, you are creating so strong separation that uh, if you later find out that uh, some object should exist not in this boundary context but in another boundary context it becomes kind of expensive to move uh, these objects in between uh, those bounded contexts so we can't simply say uh, why don't you just make it right create the boundaries as it should be so uh, for instance in, in a startup where you are learning so uh, about uh, a new domain, you are learning everything that uh, the product has as a potential. You are uh, learning every characteristic that shows off uh, what is the startup core domain. Um, it could be that uh, after one year, two years, you say, oh, we could have created this boundary at the beginning, but uh, I, it is naive to say that you can create the boundaries uh, right just from the beginning. What you can do is create light boundaries at the beginning, and as long as you learn uh, about the domain, you create more strong walls between those bounded contexts uh, as, as long as you learn more about uh, those bounded contexts. So uh, one, one learning rule is that you, you can't simply say, uh, because if you, if you talk about uh, an eShop application that you have inventory, uh, sales, order, it's quite easy to say, oh, this is this bounded context, this is another bounded context. So it is a trivial uh, domain. And you can say upfront how the boundary should be uh, created. But when you are talking about a product that you are just learning about it, you can simply draw those boundaries upfront. Uh, what you can do is, is say that one bounded context is owned by a single team uh, that uh, creates the, the language inside uh, that bounded context. Another focus on, on DDD is to, to focus on the important and core business features. So, uh, we can try to make everything perfect, but uh, if everything is perfect, you simply spend too much uh, on unimportant stuff because writing code that is DDD, uh, <laughs> DDD driven requires much more code than simply uh, writing a crude application. Uh, so, when working with DDD, one thing that you also need to understand is what is my core business and what is not my core business. Because if it is not my core business, I shouldn't be uh, domain driven design using the tactical design inside that boundary context. You, you should create simply a boundary site. Inside this boundary, this is a support, uh, support boundary context and I can use the trivial solutions and that will be good enough. But if you found a core, uh, core domain and you, uh, you, you see that uh, designing it 
uh, with a good vocabulary that everyone can understand, then your business, you get more value. Then you can use tactical design. The tactical design are building blocks and design patterns that will enrich your domain model uh, with constructions uh, that are recognized by the development and can be understood by domain experts. Uh, it's not something that you can um, clearly say to everyone. It's kind of a low level design. Uh, it's also hands on and definitely is not an anemic model like with crude application. But le let's see what you are talking about. Uh, as you, you all know, I support this um, clean architecture application that is uh, simply wallet application that has open account, close, deposit and withdraw and transfer. And also have uh, security and persistence infrastructure. Um, I, I've been using domain driven design on this solution and I can share some building blocks that I use it that that helped me design it. And the, the list of these design patterns include uh, entity, aggregate root, repository, value object, domain service, application service. Uh, all, all these patterns, uh, they are part of the domain driven design patterns and you can identify just by opening the, uh, the source code which pattern they are following. So let me explain by examples. So uh, a virtual wallet application is simply a account balance application where uh, there is an account and this account you can have credits and debits and it, it's kind of a transactions. So you have an account with transactions and this account belongs to a customer. Um, what what uh, I learned by designing this is that um, I can't simply add a debit to my account without going to the account and see what's the balance. So I can't simply create a debit without going to the uh, uh, account and, and checking the balance. So the, the account is the aggregate root that uh, manages the consistency of this uh, graph of entities. So account needs to have a consistency between credits and debits. So in a way that I can't withdraw more than I have in my account. Uh, so uh, usually we have in a database a set of entities and that is the, the pattern that we follow uh, most of the time. But in blue here, I, I'm introducing this aggregate root design pattern that uh, manages the consistency in this uh, object. And the, the account balance was the, the whole domain of the solution. Um, I, I started as an account balance bounded context uh, saying that everything from the customer and the account and credits and debits was a single bounded context. That is how I started the solution. Uh, later on, uh, when I, I, I was learning about the domain and, and I saw that the customer um, had, has a kind of a separated support bounded context because it wasn't 
exactly the core domain of this wallet. Uh, then uh, emerged the customer bound context. Uh, that in this case has a single aggregate root and its values value objects. Uh, but it's a completely separated application. I can uh, a separated bounded context. I could have a, a, a off the shelf solution to manage the customer, which is fine. Uh, but I put my effort into implementing the balance bounded context with a language that I could understand and I could evolve with the use case that I wanted. Uh, later on, I had a transfer use case that I could uh, manage uh, uh, transactions between accounts. So uh, my my learning into into this journey was that uh, when learning about a domain, I would start with the most lightweight bounded contexts and context mapping. So uh, the code live side by side. Uh, but even though living side by side in a shared kernel uh, context map, uh, I could extract the customer bounded context and establish a uh, I would say anti-corruption layer between the balance bound context and the customer bound context. Um, even uh, in, in, in this journey, I learned about the uh, aggregate root, which is the entity, but has a special role of managing the consistency of all the entities uh, below it. Um, and talking about code, uh, I'm, I'm going to show some code snippets from the Clean Architecture Manga project. Uh, so an entity in domain-driven design uh, has some characteristics, like um, uh, it it needs to have an ID, could be a composite. ID, but it needs to have an ID that uniquely identify uh, it inside the aggregate root. So um, usually uh, an entity is mutable, so you, you can uh, execute operations on the entity and it will uh, mutate in between, uh, mutate its state. And entities are highly abstract. Uh, it it shouldn't talk about uh, how it is persisted. Uh, maybe it has some constructions for persistence, but they are not driven by the persistence mechanism. They they should be high, highly abstract uh, classes. So in this case, the credit is a kind of a transaction. In, in the manga project. Uh, the credit ID here is the, the identification. And there are some constructions here that I use it, like for instance, for money, uh, I, I don't have a, a decimal value for it. Uh, I have a, a, mo a money class that is exposed. We can see it on the iCred interface that is visible to the other classes. Uh, but uh, the value objects, they help you uh, express the, the, the language, the ubiquitous language into code. So you, you can see that the credit has a money, uh, has a description. In this case, it's a string, but uh, that's the intent of the value object. I, I help you describe. And as I said before, the entity has an, a single ID uh, that uh, defines uh, its unique uh, instance, but a value object is a more 
verbose class that encapsulates time, time concepts, time business rules. So, uh, and it is uniquely identified by the comparison of its properties. So, and, and I would put a rule that value objects are, are immutable or we should make the class immutable. There is one drawback of using value objects. It's because in, in C sharp, for instance, it's quite hard to make a class immutable. You, you need to have uh, these constructors and these constructors should set all the properties and you shouldn't have methods that change the internal state. Um, in C Sharp 9, uh, which is coming uh, next month, you, you have the records, um, which will simplify it a lot because uh, I think the the language people, they, they found out that uh, value object is a design pattern uh, and they are creating this record that basically removes all this uh, comparison equals operators and simplifies it a lot. Um, I, as I, I introduced before, the aggregate root is it is still an entity uh, it, it has an id uh, but the responsibility that it has in your uh, bounded context is to ensure the state consistency of the children entities uh, as, as i said i can't uh, simply add a transaction adapt the transaction without asking to the aggregate root, hey, aggregate root, do you, do you have balance uh, before I add in a debt transaction? Because the aggregate root needs to maintain this consistency. Uh, and it, it is also expected that this is also abs an abstract concept, do not have uh, strong influences from the persistence mechanism. It, it also very stable class. It shouldn't have dependencies to uh, external services or because if you include that, then you have to make uh, lots of. Uh, it will affect your serialization mechanism later on. And Aggregate roots, when they are working side by side with each other, uh, it is advised that they talk to each other only by their IDs. So if there is an aggregate root and it needs to reference another aggregate root, uh, the, the relationship between these two should be weak because at any moment, you should be able to move an aggregate root from this bounded context to another bounded context. Uh, so uh, that is the general ad advice of keeping allow coupling between aggregate roots and so and reference each other by their IDs only. And this is another this is a design pattern that is part of the domain driven design, the repository. And, and this is the, the most common. We usually have entities, which is uh, also design pattern from domain driven design and repositories. So in one way or another, we are very, uh, very much introduced to domain driven design, but we are very much introduced to the lightweight domain driven design, which is, um, not that good. <laughs> uh, so you can consider that the previous slide is just putting that you, you have much more than simply entities and repositories. And, um, and th there is one, one thing that I put as a rule 
for uh, entities and repositories is that if you have a kind of a complex domain and then you found out that you have like several entities and for each entity you have a repository means that you don't have aggregate root basically uh, because uh, only aggregate roots should have an access to a repository uh, so the aggregate root ensures the consistency so uh, the repository is responsible of uh, persisting the state of aggregates uh, and there is no no easy way to to say that a repository is only for aggregates but uh, i wouldn't use repositories for every entity that you have on your uh, bounded context and the use case is not really a uh, like a domain driven design pattern uh, in in some in some literature it is called application service uh, i i prefer more um, the, the usage of use case definition and and for me the the use case it's it's a kind of a application entry point that you can execute uh, independently and um, and the, the application is organized around those use cases. So uh, the use case when you when you have a set of use cases, it shows uh, the usage of that uh, bounded context. And I think that was all that I uh, prepared. And as I as I said, uh, check out the, the clean architecture manga. It's the, the most uh, rich application that uh, I support nowadays. Uh, that is, it is following the domain-driven design and uh, also test-driven development. And yeah, let's maybe we could have some questions. First of all, thank you. Yeah, Patrick, you have a question. Maybe you can hear me now. Yes. Very good. Uh, you said entities should be mutable, but your entity was immutable except for this accounting, which I'm not sure what it is. I'm pretty sure I disagree that they should be mutable. But yeah, I, I think you should expect. You can expect that they are mutable. Uh, it can be mutable. Because. Uh, let let me say in other words. Value objects is pretty much immutable, uh, but uh, an entity you expect methods that it expose behavior, right? Possibly. Yeah, yeah. So possibly. So if it it could expose behavior, it will change the internal state. Of, of the entity and and that is what I'm saying uh, mutable you can always create a new instance of it uh, but yeah that is another approach uh, but I, I would say that you expect entities and aggregate roots to expose uh, methods that uh, that implements behavior so yeah, I, I see I see for aggregate roots, I agree that in the language like C sharp at least making them mutable is much easier. But I think and this is just I, I like functional programming. Yeah, I don't I, I I I I'm not convinced I agree that entities should be and definitely in your I mean the one you showed I think was a transaction, so it definitely shouldn't be mutable because that's sort of yeah. the definition of a transaction. But maybe that was a bad example in terms of yes, mutability. Because, <laughs> yes, we, we could have 
different examples. Um, maybe, yeah, it's it's hard to think about one example, but I would expect. Uh, but if but you can definitely implement it totally immutable, and you can implement completely immutable objects if you if you follow uh, functional programming. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've, been, I've been trying to bring an immutable religion, but C sharp isn't really the language for that. Yes, it's not. Uh, <laughs> it is. Uh, it's like a, even for value objects, it is quite hard to make them immutable. Yeah, uh, it's a pain. We uh, we we have a lot of these uh, immutable value objects in the code base for the new stuff, and it's a pain. So maybe record types will save us when they yeah. arrive. Yes, but but thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm glad to to have learned why why it's good to reference by ID <laughs> between the uh, between the aggregate roots. I just learned that you should do, but but uh, the uh, uh, with the background that uh, it should be easy to move between uh, boundary context. That was uh, uh, that was new for me. Yeah, thanks for that. You said you, you would only uh, and about repository things. You 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 said like one repository per aggregate root is like the way to go. And yes, uh, it's because when you when you say that an entity has a repository, so then you are implicitly creating the responsibility of an aggregate root. And w what I say that you shouldn't have a repository for all of your entities, uh, it, it is because then the, the responsibility of aggregate root is uh, to be rised. It's like uh, too fragmented in the application. So the idea of the aggregate root is that it set small clusters, and these clusters has uh, an aggregate root on top, and the aggregate root uh, has a relationship with the repository that can persist that graph of objects uh, at any moment. And that also allows you to have a repository that is SQL server. And, and then you have that later on, the customer is a MongoDB repository. So it has a completely separated uh, implementation of repositories. So I have another question about yeah. repositories. Uh, where are, are you saying they it should be the aggregate root that uses the repository? No, uh, it is. Um, there is a one to one relationship between aggregates and repositories, but it's usually the service on top of it, which is the use case or application service that coordinates the aggregates and repositories. Yeah, okay, so that's that's what I thought you were saying, but I wasn't sure yeah. from the slides. Yeah. You talked about uh, the shared kernel uh, uh, in your uh, in your example with your virtual wallet uh, wallet and the customer. What what was the part of the shared wall, uh, sh shared kernel there? That's uh, uh, I have to brush up on the shared kernel. Okay, uh, I I should have uh, explained it one by one but uh, a shared kernel is a it's a library that is shared in the same code base okay so it is very lightweight boundary between those bounded contexts uh, but uh, it, uh, this shared context uh, this shared library should be owned by a single team so uh, if you have a bounded context, this shared kernel should belong to a single team. Uh, otherwise, you are going to have uh, influences uh, that do not reflect the vocabulary that everyone understands. Uh, I would say that I start with the shared kernel because it is lightweight. Uh, you, you can't simply draw lines and say that everything is an anti-corruption layer. 
because then you're creating a very strong walls between everything and these walls are expensive to build. Mm. Uh. Patrick, you had something more? Yeah, so, but the shared kernel is still sort of domain of this. It's not just generic usable, useful utilities. It's it's still domain stuff. It's still domain. Yeah, it is not simply a uh, use class. Uh, it is, uh, for instance, and that is a very clear case startup way. You are learning about a domain. You don't know what will be the final uh, design. So then you, you, you put everything together. And later on, you, you found out that, oh, this part is a core business solution. So uh, and this is just a support that I can have a product off the shelf in the market and he use. Uh, and later on, you separate those two, the core and the support domains. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, anyone else? Some some good okay. questions? Patrick, do you have more? Yeah. Anyone? <laughs> Not, nothing more right now. Uh, did I have um, some? I have a question uh, about uh, entities and immutability. Uh, I was wondering if you have uh, immutable entities and you want like a new entity that represents the same object, would you also copy the ID from the old object or would you like create new entities with new IDs? Um, uh, I'd say that if two entities have the same ID, they are the same. That's the idea. Uh, have multiple like immutable entities with the same ID. Uh, I mean, you no. would not, you wouldn't replace an entity with another one with the same ID. Well, you can. Uh, what I'm your your aggregate root can have the entities in like in different states but at the end is the aggregate root that should ensure the consistency yeah. uh, of the of that transaction so uh it, maybe by using functional programming you have to create a second instance of that entity that has the same id uh, but at the end of the transaction the aggregate root should persist uh, only one of them. Yeah. Uh, in, ensuring that uh, that graph of objects is consistent. So, so if I can interject, I, I think there should only be at any given time one entity object for a given ID. That's, I mean, that's reachable in a certain yeah, context. Yeah, that, that's what the case I meant. But the, yeah. I understand that the aggregate route is the as the responsibility of if if you're going to have multiple multiple different ones around they should have different ids or at least some kind of version concept that in effect means they have different ids yeah totally so like different. if you want a history thank you thank you anything else if not uh, then we will we thank you for this uh, nice presentation from you. And I, as we did last time, uh, I want to share my screen. Do you see it? Did I did I did I manage? Yes, thank you. Great. And uh, as the last time, uh, we give away something for charity, uh, and you have. To pick one, it was hard the last time, so I took away the one that you uh, that you picked. So you have a, so you have to think once again. So it's the say it's WWF uh, for the rainforest or even Hosier in Swedish, and I'm not going to try that in English. And then uh, you have Amnesty International. Yeah. Uh, 
so you can pick and choose where you want to, which one you want to support. Uh, it, it is always hard. Uh, I think everything has strong purpose, but Amnesty International, I think it's. OK. Uh, then we will donate 500 <laughs> krona to Amnesty International. And uh, we thank you, Ivan. Yeah, thank you. Thank a lot. you. Yeah. And I uh, hope to see you in two. We hope to see you in two weeks again. Yes, yes. If you Let's have the possibility. About... <laughs> Let's talk about clean architecture. Yeah. <laughs> On the next meeting. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that this, this meeting has a, a purpose at the end. And I think it's also very nice. That's good. OK, thank you all, guys. Uh, we see you tomorrow, and uh, Ivan, we see you in two weeks. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay. Have a nice thank evening. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.